Uh, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Francois. I'm a chairman and one of the co-founders of the China Forum. It's the second term of the China Forum um, this time, and we are pleased today to have as our inaugural speaker, um, Lady Tessa Kessick, who will be giving a talk on her personal interactions with China since uh, her first visit to the country in the 1980s. So without further ado, I'll be passing on the floor to James, who will uh, lead the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, so I uh, don't want to repeat what Francois just said. Uh, our guest today, who we're very happy to welcome, is uh, Tessa Keswick, Lady Keswick. Tessa Keswick, Tessa. I should call you Tessa, okay. Uh, who is someone who has uh, great experience traveling in China and knows, understands the country very well, and is also connected to um, a brand which is a significant part of the history of both mainland China and Hong Kong. Uh, the brand I have in mind is a uh, multinational company, Jardine Matheson, which dates its uh, history back to the Hongs or trading companies who operated in Guangzhou and Hong Kong from the beginning of the 19th century, serving as intermediaries in the trade between China and the West. Uh, in line with this uh, beginning, uh, uh, of China's opening out into uh, international relations, uh, its uh, fate has remained um, ever intertwined with that of China's through war, peace, reform, and opening up. Uh, Tessa's primary connection is uh, through her husband, uh, Henry Keswick, who's chairman of Jardine Matheson. And through this connection, she has enjoyed a really unique uh, perspective on uh, China's economic transformation um, over the past couple of decades. Uh, in January 2020, she. Uh, uh, published a book, The Color of the Sky After Rain, detailing her thoughts on this subject, uh, which um, earned praise from the historian and professor uh, Andrew Roberts, uh, who described it uh, with the following, at precisely the time that we need to understand China more than ever, along comes a book that is incisive, honest, witty, and beautifully written, which explains the Chinese people and society to a Western audience superbly. And to that end, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Tessa Keswick. Thank you very much, James. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. It's a great honor, to, um, especially to speak to Cambridge um, students, um, uh, the home of so many Chinese scholars, including, of course, my hero, one of my heroes, Joseph Needham. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, Francois and James. I, I'm going to tell you some of my impressions over the last 40 years. The intention of my book, as James has just said, is to try and explain to European, uh, to Western people, more about what the Chinese are like. And um, I know we have several Chinese um, listeners here today, and I hope they'll forgive me if I say anything untoward. Um, now, I first went off, I mean, I talk about three different areas. Um, first of all, going into China in 1982. Um, then how I got to know it on my own, traveling on my own. Secondly, how I traveled with my husband, Henry Keswick, as, as James said, a chairman of Jardine Nelson, under the aegis of Jardine Nelson. And finally, about our friends, the friends we made in China. Um, in, in 1982, a business friend of my a business friend had been granted concessions in two of the newly opened up economic zones on the coast of China, Ningbo and Wenzhou. Following the collapse of the Qing dynasty, the civil war, the war with Japan, and 30 years of communism, at that time, China was in the most deplorable state. The paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping, had recently declared Geiger Kaifang, but communism still held the country in its grasp for fear that communism had not gone away. The Chinese government needed everything modernized, ports, roads, housing, factories. I accepted a job to find British businesses who'd be interested in investing in this modernization. My boss and guide was David Tang, the first Chinese I ever met and who I befriended um, very much so or for the rest of our, our lives. Sadly, he's now dead. 
Men and, men and women then wore Mao suits still and caps. No one appeared in charge. The cities and villages were black and the atmosphere was decidedly gloomy. The food situation main, it meant that we mainly lived on boiled eggs. Six of us traveled by minivan to Ningbo, the historic water port of Shanghai. It was deserted, no ships visible with rusty equipment lying about, meetings with officials who smoked nonstop but never looked us in the eye. We left on a rickety road, which was the only land access to Wenzhou, now one of the most entrepreneurial cities in China. As we bumped our way across the mountains, lorries would turn off their headlights thinking that they were saving valuable petrol. The fields were fertilized with night soil, though the only decent meal we had was in a village shack, which had mud for flooring. In Wenzhou, the story was the same. The factories were mostly closed or full of rats and broken machinery. David Tang entertained us royally with stories about his traditional family in Hong Kong. Um, and he was sent to boarding school at 12, knowing no English, but he had no trace of a Chinese action, accent and could show, quote, volumes of Shakespeare and other poets. The weather was stifling. On the last day, we drove out of Wenzhou in the mist and drizzle, heading for Hangzhou. Peasants walking on the bumpy road who had never seen white people before smiled and stared at us. The mists swirled down from the mountains and the Chinese, of course, still believed that these were inhabited by spirits who they fear. We drove on, we drove on, and, and suddenly the mist parted as we drove up the mountain and a ray of sunlight came through the, through the literally through these mists, these wispy mists, um, illuminating the countryside in the most extraordinary way. The high jagged hills that are so familiar in China with the trees along the tops, the exquisite terraces so carefully planted with rice, hugging the hillsides, and the borders were decorated with sunflower plants. And the color of the sky, it was the color of the sky after rain. At that moment, I was captivated. The combination of the sudden beauty and the refined husbandry of those impoverished people really gripped me. We drove on to Hangzhou, one of the several ancient capitals of China. We arrived at a rundown guest house beside the West Lake. This was the guest house where it is said that Chairman Mao uh, visited at least 40 times um, coming down from Beijing on his private train. It was nighttime when we tumbled into the hotel. Um, and the, the next morning at breakfast, we compared notes about the rats in some of the bedrooms. Fortunately, not my own, but we found ourselves surveying out of the windows, one of the most beautiful places on earth. Emperors, philosophers, generals, poets had, 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 had been here and even had houses here by the West Lake over the centuries. General Lim Biao's house is still in the foothills where he used to look at girls swimming in his pool through two way mirrors and we know what happened to him. And even Marco Polo commented in his memoirs on the beauty of the lake. So ended my first visit to China. Like Joseph Needham, who fell in love with China when his girl's friend, Gui Jun, wrote for him the character for cigarettes when they lay smoking in bed. I was hooked. I couldn't wait to go back. So I did go back and the first place I headed to was the cradle of civilization, traveling along the low reaches of the Yellow River, the mother of sorrows. I sat on the dike at Huayuan Ko, where Chiang Kai-shek disastrously broke the banks of the levees to halt the Japanese advance from Nanjing. I marveled at the Shang and Zhou bronzes, some lying in the basement of the Zhengzhou Museum because of lack of funds. I saw the oracle bones and the pictograms, which are still detectable in Chinese calli calligraphy today. I became aware of the mandate of heaven promulgated by forerunners of the Han, which even today gives the emperor president of China a legitimacy he loses if he fails to satisfy the people. The Zhou dynasty 
which preceded the Han was the longest in Chinese history. I visited Confucius's house at Chu Fu and tried to understand Taoism and legalism, three philosophies which are still invoked today, 3000 years later. Then Confucius had been quite out of, at those days, Confucius had been quite out of fashion for a while. In Xi'an, I inspected the renovated terracotta warriors, warriors at that time set in a rudimentary tent and had my camera removed at gunpoint. I visited the wonderful mosque. I saw the first Chinese banks and walked the walls of Pinyao. I drove up through the lowest hills to Yan'an, the cradle of the revolution, and was photographed in the cave bedrooms of both Mao Zedong and Xu Enlai. I decided to travel to the borders of China where for centuries the emperor's armies had battled to keep control. China, as you well know, is bounded by sea in the east and the south, by mountain ranges and the Tibetan plateau in the south and the west, and is open in the north. The gateway into China is from Xinjiang and down the Hershey Corridor and from the northern steppes. Over the years, I explored Yunnan, Sichuan, the Tibetan grasslands of Qinghai. And How do I stop that? This is terrible. Anyway, I'm so sorry. I don't know why that happened. Um, I, the Gobi, I did the, um, Sichuan, the Tibetan grasslands of Qinghai and Gansu, the Gobi Desert and the Taklamakan. Um, and the Taklamakan and the desert of the Ordos Loop. I visited the homeland of the Qing tribes in Chiang Bai Shan on the Korean border and saw at first hand the cradle of 20th century conflict in Manchuria, Dongbei as it is known today. As I traveled, I saw China change and grow. When I started, there were almost no cars and no tourists. Now millions cross China every year. One thing I noticed right away was how the Chinese government clearly was trying to make improvements, not just in the cities, but in the countryside. It wasn't just in the cities that things were changing for the better. Attempts were being made all over China. Of course, changing the abject conditions in the countryside was very slow and very difficult. It remains so today. Are there still barefoot doctors in China? In 1985, in 1985, I married Henry Keswick, who was then chairman of Jardine Matheson, and as he was until three years ago. Henry was born in Shanghai in 1938, with his father and uncle, when his, where his father and uncle ran their flourishing business, but their good fortune was about to end. In early 1942, with the advance of the Japanese, the family left Shanghai, but only just in time. After liberation in 1949, Jardines and all the capitalists in Shanghai uh, had to fled from the communist takeover. Many of the Chinese, along with Henry's father and uncle, fled to Hong Kong, which had a small population then and had suffered dreadfully under the Japanese during the war. All of these Jeff refugees and many more over the years would seek shelter in the then British colony and build Hong Kong to what it is today. During the 1950s and even 1960s, there was no guarantee that the communists would not come into Hong Kong at any time. Following Geiger Kaifeng, many businesses, including Jardines, were reluctant to return to China. Henry and I visited Beijing on our honeymoon in 1985. It was not an auspicious visit. Later, Jardine suffered because they voted for the pattern reforms of 1992 and had a Hong to a red-headed letter put out on Jardines to prevent her doing business in China for the next five years. By 1998, this was rescinded by the Chinese government and Henry was delighted then to return to China to look for investments. We celebrated by visiting Shanghai and marveled at the changes that were taking place. We traveled to Chongqing, designated as an important development area where we travel and we traveled by boat down the Yangtze River. We knew there had been floods that year, 
and the occasional dead human body swirled in the muddy waters as we passed by. But this visit to Chongqing was principally a corporate visit and the first of many um, I would make in China with Jardines to the first tier cities looking for investments. There in Chongqing, we met the first municipal officials who were beginning to rebuild China. We were mightily impressed. They were youngish, but experienced, direct, enthusiastic about their mission to make their particular metropolitan area the best in China. They were extraordinarily friendly over and above any commercial consideration. It was a breath of fresh air, a world apart from what I had seen in Ningbo and Wenzhou 15 years before. We would find officials of caliber all over China. As Jardines began to do business, we made friends there. As opportunities expanded, we met the Chinese entrepreneurs who were trying to rebuild and modernize as well. After the year 2000, it was an extraordinary period where anything was possible. Airports, motorways, massive tour blocks, new cities sprung up almost overnight. My friend Fumei came back from her to her home one evening, having left that morning, and told the driver he'd come to the wrong place. A park with a working fountain had built, been built in front of her house that very day. <laughs> Jardines was a small company at that time and had to work hard to be heard. And we traveled from city to city, making a case against companies of greater weight than we were. The formula involved making friends with the man party secretary at highly formal, formal meetings where the case would be made, had to be made for why Jardines was a good thing. We encountered nothing but welcome and charm and extreme good manners. As time went by, Jardines gradually developed a portfolio of business in China. This thing about um, a welcome and charm and extreme good manners, if you read travelers in the 19th century, um, even, even in Canton, um, the, the Australian journalist Morrison, who traveled at great danger actually, um, not even speaking Chinese, 1500 miles into China, said exactly the same thing this extraordinary good manners and, and kindness. Meanwhile, I continued to make my own travels over several years. I went to live in a family in Beijing, with a family in Beijing to make an attempt, a late attempt to learn Mandarin. Lao Zhou and Lao Zhang had both worked in the aircraft factory in North Beijing and their Dan Wei had given them a flat there after they retired but their son had also given them a flat in Chongunmen. Lao Jiang was a Hui, though she was virtually non-practicing. The Joes had their own new modern flat, a car, and a, their son had a house north of the Great Wall. We drove there for weekends. My life in between travels became, became entwined with theirs and their many friends. At the same time, we were inviting our corporate Chinese friends to stay with us in Wiltshire. We strongly believe that this sort of constructive engagement was helping to build trust and understanding. We learned from each other. It was as great a time to be in China and in Wiltshire with them as well. As I concentrated on my Chinese lessons, I was intrigued when Lao Jiang kept referring to her family as Lao Baixing, which means ordinary people. I asked why she referred to herself and to her family as that when they had a flat. In fact, they had two flats, a car and a house north of the wall, and also a good pension. Surely they were better off than most people. Lao Zhang said, we are all Lai Bai, Lao Baixing because we have no power. I had wondered why Chinese people have a dimension that Western people do not have. I had wondered what it was. Was it something in their intact 3000 year culture, their unifying language, the ancient unifying philosophies, which are still relevant and meaningful? Does the mandate of heaven offer some protection, but not enough? I realized from what Lao Zheng was saying, 
what Lai Zhang was saying was that the Chinese value trust above everything because they have no reliable law to protect them. We can be confident with our contracts and our individual human rights. And they have to navigate through life, not knowing who and what to trust. It gives the Chinese another dimension, which is very compelling and very attractive. We must have had it once, but when custom turned to contract in the late 19th century, we lost it. But the Chinese have a sensibility we do not have. It is more profound than simply the notion of face. Henry, who greatly admires the Chinese, has done extensive business and done extensive business with them, says that in over 40 years, he has never been let down by any partner in mainland China, but maybe he is a particularly good judge of character. We should remember that while the West was making weapons, China was producing the best ceramics and the best silk, which the West could not do. They also made and honored jade and lacquer as auspicious subjects, objects, rather, sorry. From experience, the Chinese considered the West to be warlike and unreliable. I was so fortunate to see China during those years of Gaiga Kaifang. I have not been back since 2018, but some of our friends have been over to see us. I know when I do get back, I will be dazzled yet again by what has gone on since I left. I've just skated over the surface here. China and her extraordinary and serious people, together with their culture, are too remarkable not to learn and engage with. There are differences on both sides, but the West should refrain from megaphone diplomacy, and we must speak our minds behind closed doors. And I hope and believe the Chinese would still like to be friends with us. Once friends, there are none better. I'm a firm believer in constructive engagement. Thank you. I hope that wasn't too long. No, that was perfect. Thanks so much, Tessa. Really given us a sense of how um, you've experienced both through space and geography, the, the breadth and variation of China. Um, and also, uh, thanks for um, drawing attention to the need to really uh, focus on a constructive dialogue between the two countries um, and avoiding grandstanding, real honest, um, conversations of what's needed. So I just want to begin by asking, uh, in light of uh, your a huge knowledge of China and um, your time spent there. Uh, is there any area in China which you feel most drawn to or which, um, or, or Henry felt most drawn, drawn to for that matter? Um, well, Henry's drawn to business. Mm. <laughs> he will always do more business there, but I can't answer that question for him. Geographically, um, though. Geographically. Well, actually, geographically, I very much like the outlying areas mm. because, um, first of all, there aren't so many people because of now, of course, it's become so busy. But they, the, the mountains, I mean, I come from mountains myself, and the mountain areas of China and, um, you know, the south, Yunnan, with its flowers and its extraordinary climate is simply wonderful and uh, Sichuan to the, the Tibetan the Tibetan monasteries I mean the I, I think the places even the deserts uh, I like these rather remote places and then the, you suddenly find some marvelous monastery or um, um, everywhere you find extraordinary things but yes it's the outlying areas I like most the borders the western I suppose the western borders quite honestly yeah so do you suppose that's where you'll initially return to once it becomes possible to travel again? But if I was going, I've never been to Tibet and I've rather avoided going to Tibet because it's obviously an unhappy place. Um, but um, no, there are some trips I'd like to I'd like to make. I mean, I couldn't tell you exactly. Well, I'd like to go to Sichuan Bana in, in southern Yunnan, um, which has a sort of semi-tropical climate. But I'd like to do a big expedition um, from Xining up into, I'd, I'd like to do the sources of the Yellow River. I'd, I'd like to come down the Yellow River and follow the Yellow River. I think that would be a wonderful, um, from the north, um, mm. or from its source rather. 
um, and follow it around. I think that would be a wonderful thing to do, actually. Yeah. And you mentioned um, how you begun learning Mandarin with a Lao Jiang and Lao Zhou. Uh, has that uh, in any way changed uh, how you engage with China and perhaps deepened your ability to uh, get to know Chinese people? Well, yes, completely, because um, for one thing, they are so incredibly kind when, if you can say even two words, um, and I, when I was running the Center for Policy Studies and people used to come actually from the Central Party School and I'd try and put some words together to welcome them. And then they'd all clap, you know, and, and you know, instead of these sort of rather sort of serious faces, you, I, suddenly it was like the sun coming out and, mm. and it makes all the difference in the world. And I always, I've always found that and people um, just appreciate it. I, I mean, it's probably true in any, language, I think particularly in Chinese, with the Chinese, because it's probably so unexpected mm -hmm. um, when foreigners can speak, perhaps not so much now, but then I think. When, anyway, it's been, it's, it's like um, a veil being drawn apart and suddenly there's an immediate contact mm. if you can say something. But my Chinese has remained extremely rudimentary. I mm. learned too late. You're very wise to start early, James. <laughs> I wish I could speak. It's a, it's a real sadness not to be able to converse properly. You can still engage with the culture in lots of ways through the art and calligraphy and whatnot. It, yes, that yes. Be something which um, is drawn you a lot, especially the title of your book is drawn from an actual color defined by um, Chinese art scholars. Um, yes, I'm found on song um, on song covers. Yeah, yeah, that wonderful song, um, um, ceramics, uh, rue yes. But do you find that uh, through this process of Gaigo Kaifang, um, kind of what drew you to the country originally? Um, well, in like, of the, uh, the, cities, the thing which drew you to the country originally, which seems to be in spite of the cities being quite undeveloped and perhaps even unsanitary once you venture out into the countryside, you, you find this um, uh, such a such strong um, peasant tradition, how they terrace their rice fields. And then you have the, uh, you're particularly entranced by the beautiful image of the sun emerging from the clouds and producing this particular cerulean color. Has that, has that been damaged, do you think, in this process of development? Um, has it affected your perception of the country? Well, I, I think it is a very different country now. Um, it, it is because, well, you know, as countries become richer, and I, do, I can't, one can't say that China, and, and this is something that's important for Westerners to know, China, in, it, for individual people, they're still not rich. I mean, the average, uh, I think the average wage is still about sort of, is it $10,000? Maybe it's $12,000 a year. It, it's still, I mean, there's still people living on, you know, a thousand dollars a year or less. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it, there's a very important uh, point there, but I mean, it, it has become, it has become much richer and very successful. Um, and, and, and I think I, I, the pioneering aspect of of it as I first saw it um, and as I saw it grow and the enthusiasm of the people to 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 grow their country and to get out of this was so extraordinary um, yes I think it is I, I would we'll never see that again that is that is that is, that is that to me but honestly it's wonderful for them so yeah. But there was a very special feel. But it was rather like, you know, in England in, I mean, I was born in 1942 and there was still rationing in England in 1956, I think. And anyway, in Scotland, it was a peasant economy still. Um, people went, were very poor. So I wasn't so totally unused. I was unused to such bad conditions, but I wasn't, I wasn't unused to, to poor conditions at all. Um, but it was pretty, it was very extreme. But I, I, as I say, it was the pioneering thing that 
was so lovely at that time. Mm. And and the lack of people, of, of, of sort of masses of tourists with cameras and all that sort of thing, which has, has taken some of the magic away. I hope that answers your question. Mm. You also talk about uh, how in uh, England, um, custom got replaced by contract. And as a result, you lost a certain level of uh, human connection uh, when yeah. making agreements with people. Whereas by contrast in China, um, kind of interpersonal trust plays a much greater role because you're not safeguarded to the same degree by a legal contract. Do you think that has changed in say the past 30 years as um, things have become more standardized in China and the rule of law has um, increased in scope? Or would you say it's still a... Well, you know, I, I mean, I haven't been there for three years. I don't know. Mm. I would think, I'm not sure how reliable the law, even though it's much better, you're right. Um, I think people are still, uh, I suspect they still have this quality. They know immediately, and one of the interesting things, they know immediately if you like them or not, a Chinese, if you meet a Chinese person, they will very quickly be able to assess whether you like them or not. That's not a consideration in with Western people. They they sort of don't mind if if they're liked or not, really, because they don't need to be. But People will know immediately if they're not necessarily liked. They can't you can't be trusted. Mm -hmm. It's terribly important to have to have the, well, for the warmth of a relationship to come through. I I think. I mean, maybe I'm completely fan, fantas, fanciful about this, but I think there is something in this which is very strong, and this is part of the reason why they mind so much being criticised. Um. Uh, we don't really mind being criticised because we're used to country being criticised. Like well, or even personally, you know, yeah. it's so much part of our culture. This you know, confrontational, where you you always have some protection. Actually, um, mm -hmm. back, uh, this is quite different. There, you confrontation is 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 really dangerous. Mm. Um, you know. Anyway, that's just a view of mine. I don't want to take it too far. <laughs> but, um... I'd like to talk a bit about uh, Jardines because uh, from our position in the UK, they're notorious as a trading house uh, whose main um, commodity in the 19th century would have been opium. Uh, yeah. So what was Jardines' position like um, after the... Um, of the, the communist uh, takeover of China in 1949. Because uh, like, I, 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 would, I would have assumed they were still quite strong, but you say they're actually a very, very small company up, up until around 2000, and their operations were very slimmed down. So what was your question exactly? What so, what, what, so what was um, Jardine's position like in the immediate aftermath of the communist revolution? Well, I think they they literally lost everything. They couldn't take anything with them. So um, they they had to relinquish their properties or whatever they had in in um, in Shanghai. And um, but they had some some go downs and a bit of land in Hong Kong. Mm. Uh, and and they and they started again there. And I think it was Jardines was was uh, capitalized at about ten million pounds or dollars in 1966 mm. um, and um, and so you know and they were selling they were selling they were trading pigs bristles and and cotton and things like that you know they were they were they were they were they they simply had to transform completely and start start again did the british government sit in their interests at the time to support Jardines during this difficult time and um, ensure they had a foothold in China uh, in, in the context of Britain rescinding its colonies, particularly in the East. And did, they, did they support them? Well, quite honestly, I've never asked that question. I don't, mm. I don't know. I, um, I imagine they did. 
but uh, certainly as the years passed, um, and and you know the 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 textile people had come from Shanghai, the bankers had come from sh some of the bankers had come from the ship shipping people had come down from Shanghai, and and they started rebuilding the city. The British, I know, comment anyway. The British governors used to fall over backwards, not ever to favoritize the British at the expense mm. of the Chinese, because they always felt this is a Chinese city. Mm. And it used to be a cause of some um, annoyance on the part of Jardines, and, and I don't know whether other companies, but who felt that they were given less um, chance under the, but maybe that was right. I mean, you know, it, I don't know. The, the, I'm sure it wasn't done in any sort of massive way, major way. Um, they were just trying to be fair, I, I would think, the British governors. They were very good. Mm -hmm. So, um, let me see. I, how did Jardines really manage to get back um, involved in, in mainland China again? Um, was, I, I read in your, um, well, you, you just mentioned now, um, during your honeymoon with uh, Henry in, 1985 um and any uh, in china it really did not seem to bode well for jardine's future involvement in china i think he met the then uh, british ambassador to china sir richard evans not the historian uh who really kind of dismissed out of hand any possibility of jardine's returning uh kind of voicing the quite facile view that Oh, with all your history of opium smuggling, the Chinese will never ever forgive you. So was there a certain process of reconciliation that had to take place in order for Jardines to be, let's say, admitted uh, back into China? Um, well, I mean, that, that's, that's difficult to say. I didn't, I think they were furious. Um, first of all, Jardy didn't try and get back further than, I mean, they were in Canton, the southern coast, on a, on a small scale. But so they hadn't tried to go back. I mean, this was purely a foreign office. Uh, Sir Richard Evans was a foreign office view. I mean, they, the, the original sin of Jardines was very strong in the foreign office um, for a long time. They felt that Jardines had behaved very badly, which no doubt they, they, they did. In, in those early days, um, certainly. But um, we, in the whole time I went to China with all my contacts who were on a, a you know, a completely different level to Henry's contacts, never once did the subject of opium was ever brought up, ever. It was quite extraordinary. It was always, and I think I put it in my book, it was a miracle of good manners to me that even though they knew about the opium um, um, connection in the 19th century, and even though it's taught in every school book, and it's, and it's been revived, I think, again, with the 100 years of, of, um, of um, humiliation, which sort of suits the, the narrative of the government or the sort of the narrative at the moment, it's being really pressed quite hard. And things like you know the destruction of the UN Ming UN, and and other matters of the of, of the imperialist behaviour, but at no time ever did anybody bring up this subject of opium, and I thought it was quite extraordinary. I mean, even people we knew in Cri like Lao Jung, Lao Jung and Lao Jung, I mean, they would talk about anything to me. Anything, they never mentioned it. Um, our, a very, very close girlfriend, I mentioned, and there's a whole chapter about her in the book, never mentioned it to me. Nobody mentioned it in a, well, you, of course, in a sort of side swipe, ever. And it was almost as though, I don't know, I, I couldn't understand it, whether it, it was because so many awful things had happened over the years. But first of all, a lot of that generation hadn't been educated, so maybe they didn't know because they hadn't been to school. I mean, the cultural people from the Cultural Revolution, as you know, did not go to school. Maybe they didn't know. Um, 
it, but it still was extraordinary because you know they're very clued up about everything and you know, as the internet came in you could find anything about it it was it was extraordinary it was extraordinary but i maybe because they're used to terrible things happening and it was just part of part of i mean i remember when it was very interesting because a couple of days ago I, it was all on television but do you remember when the miners were, were yeah. in Chile when they were coming up? And I used to say, I, I must watch the see what's happened to the miners tonight. Because night after night, it was sort of nail biting stuff. This was 15 years ago in Chile. And finally, these people came up. And Lao Zhou and Lao Zhang said to me, What's all the fuss about? I mean, why do you mind about a few miners who? Because actually in Shanxi province, they were being it was the worst accidents you could imagine happening. And yet two nights ago, I saw on television, there was a tremendous story of the, 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 the miners in China who were saved mm -hmm. at great difficulty and exactly a very similar story, actually. And they'd done brilliantly to get them out. But it was a, it was a, now it was a national event. It's basically a positive change that they're now reporting that rather than just covering up mining accidents in Shanxi. <laughs> yes, but they, they, they were, it was obviously considered to be a tremendous event to, to have done this saving. So you know, it shows how things have changed is really what I'm saying. I but, think I'll um, give the floor over to Francois now. He has some questions about um, Chinese art culture, particularly um, I.M. Pei, an artist, oh, yes. uh, an architect, really. Uh, he, um, you and Henry have Quite a lot of involvement with, I think. Yeah, yeah, a lot. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so I was wondering, uh, thank you for those uh, answers and, and talk, very interesting. Um, I, I read about you, you and your husband commissioning I Am Pei to build a pavilion uh, for your house in the UK. I was wondering if you could give some more details about this interesting uh, history and and whether you, you, you view this as a, a sort of attempt to build the, to sorry, to bridge an artistic and cultural gap between the UK and China at the time. Well, I, I didn't think of that at the time. Actually, it was it was the year nineteen ninety nine, and 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 for a long time, ever since we got married, we've got this avenue which I can see now. Looking at, I can see the pavilion, um, and it, and it had to have something at the end of it. And I really thought for a long time what would be suitable to put there because it had a tree. It looked absurd and. Um, and I couldn't think what to put. And, and I, I am a great believer in, in, as it were, cultural relevance and, and um, also you know, traditionalism, really, or an element of traditionalism. Um, and, and suddenly I saw the Miho Museum in Japan, and I suddenly realized, of course, this is a perfect architect because it, he had, so it was really because of, here we were Scots in the middle of the English countryside by virtue of the fact um, the family had been, had these connections in China, China and the Far East. And how could we sort of bring those two things together? It was before we started inviting our Chinese friends over here. So that had no, there wasn't a connection in that sense. But certainly once they started coming, it was the most marvelous um, thing to be able to show them because you know, there was a, for all, for obvious reasons, and it, it was a source of tremendous pleasure um, and 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 relevance to them. Right. Right. Um, so I just want to see if anyone from the floor has any questions. I think Morrison might, or I can see Lily's got her hand up. Um, should, we, should we have a question from Lily and then Morrison? Hi, thank you for your talk. It was quite interesting. And I was particularly fascinated by your talk uh, with uh, Lao Zhou and Lao Zhou, if I remember their name correctly. Um, so uh, I am a history student and I've been reading about a social history in Eastern Europe. And I found a surprising parallel, say your experience in terms of the, the element of trust, basically the personal element in doing business when the institutional element was uh, absent. There's 
quite a similarity to say uh, Czechoslovakia or East Germany or to an extent uh, Poland, actually to a large extent Poland and East Germany comparatively in the 60s and 70s in which say the middle class people, upper middle class, they've got uh, economic power but not particularly political power. So the element of trust and impersonal relationship was still quite pertinent in doing say business. So I'm just wondering what sort of roles do culture play in the process, if anything, given the sort of similarities we see across the world in sort of institutional situations more so. Can you just say that last bit? Can you ask the question again? Because I so Basically, to, to simplify it um, in a way, do you think the sort of element of trust is cultural or institutional in terms of context? Cultural or institutional? I think it's probably cultural, isn't it? I'm not sure what the difference is, really. So in that, I think I find it really interesting that the two different, uh, say, two different societies or multiple different societies in, say, different zones of culture, they have relatively similar practices at different times, of course. But the descriptions were quite similar. I find it fascinating. Just want to ask about the question. Well, well, well I mean, I imagine the the source of the the need for trust comes from the same same problem which is the institutional safeguards are lacking i mean in those east european countries um they they lived under communism did they not they, these were people who were living under communism or who had had uncertain uh legal systems I um, mean, which is which is similar to China, where if you can't rely on on any recourse, should things go wrong, you have to be sure that what you're doing is absolutely right. Is this going to work? Isn't that? I'm I'm not explaining it very well. But I, I mean, I think the problem is the same. Whether whether so it's, it's institutional, then isn't it? The institutions are not there to be able to provide the safeguards of, of entering into contracts with other people, even if it's just a sort of very slight one. Even if, you know, do I answer, have I answered your question? Yes, basically just the role of culture and how it actually plays out in practices and it's quite interesting. Thank you. Yes, yes. Morrison, go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for your uh, talk. It was fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask again, going back to that point about uh, the difference before about 2000 uh, with the West's practice of using contracts versus the Chinese uh, more trusting way of doing business. Do you think uh, that approach influenced who China? Uh, invested in uh, around sort of 2000. So there was heavy investment in Africa. And I was wondering if that was possibly because, and the Middle East and countries around China. Do you think who China decides to do business with and invest in was greatly influenced by uh, less strict legal practices in business? I would think so, yes, yes. I mean, I would, I would think that, I mean, by all accounts, there was, there was some quite hard-nosed um, contracts and decision, decision to invest in particular areas of Africa, and uh, uh, which, which um, meant that there was quite a, a strong hold over the situation. Um, you know. Uh, I'm not expressing my fair word. I think they were pretty hard-nosed contracts they made, the Chinese, in those areas. Mind you, they weren't necessarily made by government. They were made at all. They were made by private, private companies yeah. uh, who were sort of quite often, um, um, you know, cowboys who entered into some pretty unattractive and, um, and, and, and unfavorable contracts for the countries they were going into. So I think, yeah. 
If no one else has one, uh, I have a question. Uh, just uh, carrying up, carrying on the issue of trust. Uh, I read in your book that um, Henry would often uh, name drop when uh, talking to uh, communist officials to sort of uh, curry curry favor, I suppose. Um, but also, there were like a lot of pitfalls in that, as it's very very difficult to kind of track the star of a um, communist politician, like they might be in disgrace and you just don't know about it yet. Uh, so I'm wondering if you'd like to speak about that. Um, I'm really quite interested in um, the time you met uh, Bo Xilai, uh, actually the day before he was arrested under corruption charges. Well, that was really, that really was extraordinary. I mean, I think that was the worst Lando, we, we, uh, Henry committed. I mean, it was perfectly true that what the Chinese liked in these very formal situations in order to break the ice, um, because you would have lines of, of people from say, um, Chengdu or Chongqing or um, Shenyang sitting like that. And then the mayor here or the party secretary and then the Jardines little group here. And very, very formal, everybody, nobody's smiling. And so what they really, Henry is very good at actually, um, is making, you know, first of all, both sides would make formal speeches and then jokes, jokes and, 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 and trying to make sort of, th so Henry would mention, in order to talk about Jardines, he'd, he'd actually, you, using quite a lot of theater, which again, is enjoyed by the you know, maybe we'd met um, Beijing, um, the deputy prime minister, uh, or somebody, and we'd say, talk about it, say, oh, you know, it made our made Jardines look very important, which um, for <laughs> which sort of helped our case. And then he'd make Jake. Anyway, so this one time we we were in there. And, and Bo Xi Lai was the party secretary of Chongqing. And um, Henry had met him a couple of times at what these formed me. So we arrived in China and we were going from city to city. And he would say, by way of sort of name dropping, of course, Bo Xi Lai this and Bo Xi Lai that. And we suddenly realized, instead of sort of smiles and, and um, you know, yes, and nodding and, and this sort of thing, there were absolutely stony faces. So after a very short time, we, Henry decided you would better drop this one, something's wrong. <laughs> and then a couple of months, two or three months later, we were in Beijing and, and we had this meeting. Meanwhile, there'd been a lot in the papers about the fact that Bo Xi Lai was in some considerable trouble. And there was this amazing meeting at, at the top of the Beijing hotel where they had this extraordinary room, a marvelous room full of antiques and, beautiful painting of magnolias, vast. Um, and there we waited. Normally, as you know, the Chinese are always on time. And we waited um, in, in, in the sort of ante room. And um, you know, the time was passing. It was, you know, we were supposed to be in half past 10 or something. And by 12 o'clock, no sign of Bo Lai. And we had to cancel our lunch. Um, and the mayor of Chongqing, who we knew, arrived and sat with us, which was very unusual because normally the other side sits separately because he would have been, he should have been with Bo Xi Lai. And so, so we talked, we walked around this enormous room. And finally, they let us into the big room. We walked around. And then suddenly there was a sort of a flutter went through the room and the doors were flung open and these enormously tall incredibly good looking Chinese came into the room and there was Bo Xi Lai incredibly good in the middle um, wearing all wearing dark suits and black ties and then Bo Xi Lai sat there Henry there and we sat down the side of, and I took some photographs very surreptitiously one of which is in my book said he looked it, mournful. It, sorry he said he looked very so mournful, mournful. I mean, the thing is, we didn't know what was going to happen, but we there were ter there were rumors and everything, and of course, being so late was really strange, and the whole atmosphere was was deadly, really, because you felt 
that something extraordinary was going on over which nobody had any control. And then he went out of the room and I was sitting opposite the mayor um, who was wiping his face and had been for quite a long time, sort of sweat pouring down his face. He looked as though he was about to be executed. And if anybody, I mean, in that room, <laughs> you would have thought, who, who was in trouble? We would have thought the mayor. But the next day they left the room. Um, they went away. They went, he went back with the mayor to Chongqing, Bo Xilai, went back. And he was arrested by the mayor as he walked down the gangplank. And he's been in prison ever since. I mean, it was just was doing? stunning. It really was. So I think we probably have time for one more question. Uh, anyone would like to take that one? Okay, go on, uh, Tian Chi. Okay, can you hear? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Lady Kasex Kathy for your speech. And uh, it seems that you're very familiar or very interested in getting into the Chinese culture and also Chinese politics right now. And and I am a student of politics, so I have a question about China, or about China's politics. And I heard that uh, Jardines almost lost everything uh, when the Chinese Communist Party came to power. And uh, then after the Deng Xiaoping's come to power, then the, the, the policy of Gaiga uh, Kaifang and, use, and the, the whole company start again and uh, develop very rapidly. So my question right now is, how do you think of the, of this uh, Chinese Communist Party? And are you afraid of losing everything again? Because even though we can think uh, Deng Xiaoping is a pragmatist, and uh, his policy just uh, um, uh, was get withheld by his successors, uh, by his uh, successors like the Prime Secretary and Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, but. Uh, the many scholars and they said that Xi Jinping will be different. And uh, as we all know that um, the, the communists said they, they believe that the total goal or they, 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 they want to, to eliminate the private park ownership. So what do you think, how do you think about this? And uh, how do you think about private, uh, the, this this regime or about this uh, party? Yes. Well, I'm rather guided by my husband on this because um, I mean he's a businessman um, in a, in our fam my husband's a businessman in our family, and he he take he has always taken a very positive view about China, and he still does. So you know, I of course if something terrible happens and Jardines disappears again, um, that would be a tragedy. Um, but hopefully that'll be after we've left this, no, well, I won't say that. But I mean, no, I mean, we, Henry has huge, huge, huge faith. Now, if something bad happens, what can we do about it? It's, it's, it's history, but we have, and he has, and so therefore I have great confidence in what he would call the good sense of the Chinese. Okay. Um, the Chinese government. Yeah, that was fascinating, Tessa. <laughs> well, yeah. I think it was. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about talking to giving my view of, of, of the Chinese <laughs> and what they're like. And I hope that hasn't caused any offense. I don't, I don't think so. It's rather cheeky of me, but I'm tr trying to talk to Western people who sometimes I'm very saddened by the fact they, they seem to know so little mm. and, and yet make rather a lot of noise. Get people to think more sympathetically about China, people, people in the West. Yes, yes, yes. Country. Okay, uh, so yeah, and thank you to the audience for um, joining us and for participating. Um, hope uh, next week um, for a panel on China's economy and its future uh, after the pandemic, uh, rebuilding um, and re-stimulating um, 
the economy in the context of worldwide economic slowdown. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, please join me in a virtual round of applause for Tessa. I think you can put a reaction on. Thank you very much, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Francois.